They've won Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Hey, you. They're entertaining everyone, so who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the House. So bad. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stars in the House. I'm James Wesley. My husband, Seth Rudetsky, is in Santa Fe, New Mexico with Anna Gasteyer tonight. So if you are in the area, it's two hours earlier there. So it's, what, 6 p.m. Um, maybe you, maybe there are still tickets available. So they are in Santa Fe. So tonight it is me, James Wesley. And as you may have seen on the title card that David puts up every show, um, we are no longer raising money for the Actors Fund. We are raising money for the Entertainment Community Fund. That's right. After 140 years, 140 years, they've changed the name. Now, no disrespect to the Actors Fund, but can you imagine if this had happened maybe six months before the pandemic, all the times that Seth and I explained what the Actors Fund was, and all we had to do was say, it helps the entertainment, you are here to support the entertainment community fund. All those misnomers, all of the all of the describing, all done with a simple name change. We love the fund. It's a great name, and it really is inclusive, which is what they wanted. It was announced at the gala last night that was both New York and Los Angeles. And um, there's actually a little um, video that is a little bit of a drum roll because they have a logo now. I didn't even realize that the Actors Fund didn't have a logo. It's like I, I, I didn't notice. Um, but here is the video that got premiered last night. It's just a little, uh, little um, splash of the new name and to help us all um, remember. I'll probably end up still calling it the Fund, which kind of encompasses both. But here we go. For more than one hundred forty years. The Actors Fund has been there for everyone in entertainment. Now, we have a name to match. Introducing... Entertainment Community Fund. Supporting a life in the arts. The spotlights! It's so cool! I guess I just kind of always thought Seth and I are not the most visual people in the world. So even if he were here next to me, we'd both be like, wasn't that always there? But anyway, um, so congratulations to the name change. I hope it makes uh, not everyone can go around watching 500 stars in the house where we explain what it is every time. So, um, so hallelujah, that name has been done. We've actually kind of known about it for a while, but finally the secret is out. Um, Anyway, um, there's, a, there's a lot we're going to talk about. Uh, we have Judy Kuhn coming up in, in a few minutes and Dr. John LaPook. It's been a while since we've done a medical check-in. And so we're going to be doing that today. Um, and it's also a way to shamelessly plug Seth's upcoming concert. I'm so excited about them. I'm always excited about them, but especially with Judy Kuhn. I mean, come on, it's Judy Kuhn. Um, and that's this Sunday. You can go to the SethConcertSeries.com, go to Broadway World. Um, and that's coming up. So um, Judy's going to um, talk about it because you may have heard, um, I think when she was doing Assassins, I'll talk to her about it. Um, she got COVID uh, basically like the entire cast did. So um, we're going to um, talk to her and have Dr. LaPook on. If you have any questions, um, you know, um, put them up and I'll do the best I can. David, Seth's gone and David is, is seeing the girl from the North Country, which speaking of all these nominations, congratulations to that show. So many nominations, so many of those people who have been on Stars in the House. So congratulations. And I also want to thank, we had some amazing guest hosts while we were gone. We had Patty Murin, Anika Larson, and Pearl Sun. So thank you very much to all three of you for doing that. And speaking of Anika, Anika is going to be part of, I don't know if you remember, several weeks, it's been several weeks since Seth and I have been here. Um, we did a show for Witness Uganda. 
um, this musical that was written or is written by um, by a couple of guys that um, that we'll see right here that we were like Matt Gould and and Griffin Matthews and. I didn't know that they were they were adopting out of foster care or in the already have slash are because they have two kids. And next thing I knew, I was asking them if they could do our benefit next Tuesday for You Gotta Believe, the only organization in New York City that's devoted exclusively to finding older teens, older kids, young adults, forever families. And they were like, sure, we'll do it. And I wrote them and they're doing it. And you can also see um, Bella Young, who's been on the show so many times. I did not know that Bellamy had been adopted. Seth saw she had posted it a couple of weeks ago on social media, and I emailed her. Not only that, she was actually in foster care when she was born. So she actually was adopted. Up, she was very young, but she was adopted out of foster care. And she's filming in Atlanta, and she has one day off, basically. And she is going to come and uh, virtually and talk to us. And then we're going to have Beth Malone is going to come sing uh, live and so is in Nicole Larson, as I was saying, and more people to come. So that's a week from today. Um, and for you got to believe. Um, so as I was saying, uh, it, so Seth and I were gone. We were we were on our cruise and we went to we, we went all we started in Barcelona and ended in Venice. And then Seth and I stayed uh, the day and night in Venice. And then we went to Portugal because we originally Audra McDonald and Will Swenson were going to be on our cruise. And then her filming schedule got completely turned around instead of beginning in September or October, it started in April. So she couldn't go, but Seth and I had already gotten our tickets because Will and Audra own a house in Portugal. So we were going to stay for a couple of days. So we already had our tickets. We were like, okay, we're going to, we're going to just keep it. We've never been there before. Beautiful, beautiful country. We basically stayed within like a two mile radius, but it was of where the hotel was, which was an H collection, which is given, probably fifteen twenty thousand dollars to the fund in the course of us doing stars in the house um and so we stayed there of course that's the view from they, they treated us like rock stars it's like we had this room and then the next thing we knew they had upgraded us to like our balcony or terrace was larger than our living room in new york um but it was really beautiful 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 met basically Sarah Bareilles' lookalike at this cookie shop. And um, and I texted Sarah and I said, do you know Sarah Bareilles'? And she was like, no. And then I said, brave. And I started singing it. And then she was like, oh, I know. And I texted Sarah, who I guess was in rehearsals or final tech for Into the Woods. And I said, I met your lookalike. And, um, and and she wrote me back and she said, thank you very much. It's a, it's a, um, a younger version of myself. And it's like, I loved it. So we did that. We explored the subway. And we did all of our, our our testing, tested a lot because we were around a lot of people and we never ate indoors. Um, never when we were in Venice, for the most part, we we wore a mask even though we were outdoors the whole time. But you know, there's those narrow passageways. And um, tested negative as you're supposed to do before you come back to the United States on Friday, the April 29th. And then April 30th, got home, I tested positive. And nothing. I had a little bit of a sore throat, a little bit of a sore throat. And I have not left my house <laughs> since I got back from Portugal and set this, set this fine. And he's at our apartment or it was until he went to Santa Fe. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to talk about that. And, um, Judy Q, Q and I saw just popped up. So we're going to talk to her cause she had COVID before I did. And Judy also, by the way, was speaking of the first, not leaving the house in uh, nine days or whatever it's been i um judy was the first person outside of my family that i saw when covid started i'll never forget that of sitting outside of her apartment very safely distanced i don't even know if we were wearing masks judy q and i see you there i'm gonna bring you on one two three judy q hi, hi judy were we wearing masks we were outdoors you remember that I don't know if we were. I do remember wearing a mask. I do remember sitting we, on my loading dock, but I don't think we were wearing masks. We were very careful. Yeah, I mean, when I don't even remember when that was. I, I want to say in June of 2020, July of 2020, Let's something see. like that. I remember that the, you were on a mission to get um, a jacket from me that you'd auctioned off yes and i you came i said how should i get it to you and you said i'm coming down i said can i put it in the mail and you were like no i'm coming down yeah <laughs> that's right it was your pocahontas jacket 
Exactly. I and forget I how much money we raised, but we raised well, a lot. <laughs> Um, so Judy, besides, I already, I already shamelessly plugged your upcoming concert, um, with Yay. Seth Rudetsky on Sunday. I cannot wait. Um, <laughs> what? Because I'm excited too, because the first time I get, or maybe the only time I've done a live stream concert, we were in different places. Yeah. <laughs> and it's much more fun to sing with someone who's in the same room with you. Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. And and we're going to be doing testing. Um, but yes. Judy, I, I was saying, did I did I get it wrong? Because you hadn't come on backstage yet. Did basically everyone in your cast of Assassins end up getting COVID? Not everyone, most... a lot of people. And is that where you I got it? Zero. Oh, so, I didn't know so that. Awful. It was so awful. Well, my husband got, you know, I had spent the entire run of the show being so careful. He was pretty much the only person I saw. And I didn't even see him a lot because he gets up in the morning, goes to his office, and then sometimes he wasn't home yet Went by the time I went to the theater. Um, and I barely even saw my daughter. I mean, we would see her or any, you know, friends occasionally outside, like we'd meet them at a restaurant outside, but it was December and January, so that didn't happen a lot. Right. It was so careful. And then he got COVID, my husband. <laughs> and he'd been pretty, he'd been very careful too. He's right. still not really sure how he got it. Wow. Um, and, you know, we've been boosted and everything. Though it had, we had passed, I think, the three month mark since our booster. But um, anyway, he got it and we immediately isolated him in another room in our apartment. I mean, <laughs> It's like when he 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 had had what seemed like a cold and he, he had tested negative. And then I came home. I think I had had a matinee or something. I came home and I said, how are you feeling? And he said, actually, I feel worse. And I was like, did you test yourself today? He said, Not yet, but I will. And I took a home test and I threw it at him from across the room and said, you have to test right now. Right. And then I put on a mask and I went into another room and then he shouted at me 15 minutes later, I have COVID. So I went running around opening all our windows and of turning course. the things on. And it was January. And I said, you have to go in another room. <laughs> so we put him in a room and I clo we closed the door. And I for four days, I would just bring him food outside his door. And, you know, I guess at the end of that week, I... I hadn't been sleeping, so I was sort of a little under the, I felt under the weather, but not really sick. Yeah. Um, I didn't have that terrible sore throat that a lot of people got with Omicron. And I tested myself every day. I mean, I wrote my company right away and said, right. who has COVID? And they said, okay. I, you know, I said, we've isolated him. They said, okay, just test every day. I was doing the at-home tests. I should have gone and gotten PCR tested, but, um, that last day I went in, it was a Saturday matinee, and I was like, oh, I think I might be feeling like a like something coming. Like in the before times, I would have said, I may be fighting a cold. Is sure. how I and um, the Sunday morning, I woke up, and I really, like that, I got that cold had gotten me. Yeah. And that morning, I woke up and took a test, and I was positive, and by Tuesday... Two more people in the company tested positive. And the next day, three people tested positive. I mean, it was just clear that this, that was it. And then we yeah. closed. Oh, my gosh. It was horrible. <laughs> and I just felt like I, fa you know, like I let everybody down. I felt like I, the minute he got sick, I should have stayed home. I, you know, but... In a way, we got through 12 weeks without, we had to cancel a couple times, but we got through a really good run. And if it had happened earlier in the run, it might have closed the show way too early. Right, right. So. I mean, the, story, I mean, so both of us are so careful. I mean, what'd you say? I said that was a really long story. <laughs> no, I mean, it's interesting because like for me, it's like, because I, I, I talked to Dr. Luke, we're going to bring, we're going to bring him on in a minute. And um, as I was telling him, 
I, you know, when, when we were on the cruise, Seth and I never ate indoors. We right. only wore masks on the ship. Um, we, we, te- if, if we, if Seth did a show with one of the performers tested right before, like right before, and, and some people would say, oh, are we testing again? And I would say, yes, you know, and, um, and I kind of think, you know, you never can really know. I kind of think I got it in Venice because it's one of those things yeah. of those narrow passageways where I was, what I was saying earlier. And, mm-hmm. and I, and I should, and I, my, 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 the voice in my head was, you should wear a mask, James, the entire time that you're outside, but no one else is really doing it, which was kind of shocking because I thought it was just America where people were kind of over the masks. And yeah. that was the yeah. eyeball opening thing. It's like, everyone's tired of them. Yeah. And and it was like, it was like pre pandemic, the way that Venice, Italy can be crowded and in those narrow passageways where there isn't good ventilation, even though we were outdoors, I didn't wear my mask nearly as much right. as I probably should have because right. I tested positive four days later. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, I, I don't know. I mean, could have gotten it some right. other place and there's no way to really know, but I know we never ate indoors. So right. let's bring on someone that both of us rely on for medical advice. And um, <laughs> because I, I don't, you you may not have any questions, but my God, all I've had this oh, I have nine questions. days for questions. So have- for Dr. LaPook. All right. So please welcome to Stars in the House, the Chief Medical Correspondent of CBS News and this program, Dr. John LaPook. Hi, guys. Hi, John. Hi. And my doctor. See, I would, I could never say that, but I know, but I can. You're allowed to. Um, <laughs> Judy, I love how you use the phrase in the before time, you know, like <laughs> before the apocalypse. I know. Well, it does. Time. It feels like the world is now divided between, you know, time is divided between yeah. before COVID and everything that's, you know, forever after. <laughs> <laughs> before, before it all. Hi, I'm glad to see you both looking perky and uh, verbal. Yes, eloquent and fast. I'm a little bit, a little bit raspy. I hope, I, you just have to take me how I am today. Uh, always will take you out, however <laughs> you are, Judy. <laughs> so, Judy, you said you had a question because I know you're not going to stick with us the whole show. So, what what question did you have? Well, my question is kind of about getting this second booster. And I, you know, I try to read everything I can and listen to all the podcasts and the news reports and the interviews with epidemiologists and whatever. And I, there, it's a lot of conflicting advice about it. I am over 50. <laughs> um, I won't tell you how much. We all are. We are um, and, uh, but I am otherwise very healthy. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I have a mild asthma sometimes, but uh, you know, for the most part, I'm healthy. I had COVID in January, so hopefully, I have some extra antibodies floating around. Though it was, it's now, you know, been four months. Um, and so, here's really what I'm thinking: is first of all, I've read that the second booster doesn't really last that long. Um, And also that there's talk about, you know, maybe there's going to be maybe in the fall or sometime in the near future, a new vaccine that's designed specifically for these variants that are now floating around. Mm -hmm. I know that this variant out there didn't make me terribly sick. I felt like I had a cold. And so you know, I, what if there's a really new horrible variant that comes in the fall and I really want to, so, but the big, but for me is that I'm about to do a lot of traveling. So I don't want to, I'm not worried about getting COVID so much as getting stuck somewhere with COVID and being able to get on an airplane and come home or where, where, go wherever I need to go. So I'm trying to decide, do I need to get that second booster before I get on an airplane in two and a half weeks? So a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> With that one question. I think here's how you think about it, because there was a New England Journal article um, last week which helped to clarify this a little bit. So the CDC advice is if, if you're, 50, you're over 50, And it's been four months or longer since your booster. You have to get the boost, the first booster. Have to, have to, have to. 
And that was, that, part, that was a no-brainer. Yeah, you have to get the booster. That's that's the first booster. The second booster, um, they kind of clarified it. They said, basically, um, there's, there's antibodies. Remember, the antibodies are the things that are stopping you from getting infected in the first place. Right. Okay. Those are antibodies. Then there's cellular immunity, which once you've been infected, that's T cell function, you know, T cells and B cells and T cells we've heard a lot about with because in AIDS, your T cells go down, helper T cells and killer T cells, okay? So the cellular immunity is what's going to stop you in the long run from, from getting seriously ill, hospitalization or death. Because because mm -hmm. this like, for example, the cellular immunity can go into cells that are infected and identify them and kill those infected cells. So right. two things. Think of the antibodies as they're on they're on the castle wall with the arrows or the guns stopping the invaders from getting in. But once it's past the, the, the wall and inside the castle, that's where your cellular immunity kicks in. Mm -hmm. So what the studies show is that you're with that fourth shot, with the with the second booster, your antibodies will in fact rise nicely um, from about peak around two to four weeks, mm -hmm. and slowly start to go down and wane by eight weeks. So if you're going on this trip, kind of makes sense to do it a couple of weeks before. I think mm -hmm. three weeks before makes sense. And you might get some protection from those antibodies from even getting infected in the first place okay. if you were exposed. Right. However, what was really great about this study was that in terms of the cellular immunity, it kept going after the eight weeks and beyond. I mean, until the end of the study, they didn't, didn't go for two years, right? But it... it Looks like the cellular immunity is long lived. So you're going to get a benefit, but you're right. Most people do very well with just the, you know, the single booster. Mm -hmm. If you want a little bit extra belt and suspenders, um, I am telling my patients to get uh, uh, the, the booster by the CDC advice. And here was the thing that was confusing. A lot of people were saying, I'm moving back so my head's not bigger than yours, you see, because that's, <laughs> I'll do that. Um, and, um, People were saying, well, I got infected, so that's that's the equivalent of a booster. Actually, not so much. So the CDC has told me over and over again, because I have a nice hotline to them, once people have, who have gotten COVID are, are fine, they're not testing positive, they're fine. And by fine, I mean not just they're getting better, they're better, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they don't have any fever, then you can go ahead and get that second booster if you're waiting or you know, if you're waiting to get it. Now, you know, there's all sorts of other issues here to talk about. There's long COVID to talk about. There's Paxlovid to talk about. Um, and there's tonight's CBS Evening News segment to talk about, which I'm really excited and I'm hoping, it's just two minutes and I'm hoping that David, I just sent it to him. I but, don't know if David's gonna be, we might have to do it next time because uh, David's seen the girl from the North Country, so. I see. <laughs> and I don't know how to, and I don't know how to upload that stuff. No, that's fine, but, but I will tell you what it is just as a tease. Yeah. Um, and I have spent dozens of hours on this in the last week, that there's something called, um, you know, conventional UVC light. You know, there's A and B that gives you sunburns, right? But C is in a range that um, has been used conventionally in, pardon me, 254 nanometers wavelength. You'll see why I'm saying that in a second. To kill germs at the top of a, of a room. So, but you can't shine it directly on people because it could cause irritation of the skin or the cornea. So they do it sideways in the top of rooms, like in hospitals and homeless shelters and prisons. They've done it for long years. The technology has been known for 80 years. Hmm. And they bring the air up to it with ventilation, with fans. It can get noisy and they fry it that way. This new UVC, far UVC, is 222 nanometers, so shorter than 254. And what the amazing thing about that is shown by like people like David Brenner up at Columbia, that that can go on your skin. It doesn't go get past the first few layers of skin, which is mostly dead. It doesn't get past that very thin tear layer, that the, the, tear, the film of tear in your eye. So it seems to be safe. There have been no long-term studies, you know, because I woke up at three in the morning thinking, well, what if it fries the microbiome on your skin? And that has some effect because we know it kills bacteria. And, uh, and viruses by disrupting their DNA, the genetic material, and maybe even some protein structure. But the exciting thing is, and it's being used in various places, buses, or railroad, uh, uh, restaurants, and, and hospitals, occasional hospitals, in a church I saw it, um, it can be used to be shining down from the ceiling into a room 
and could be a, something in another layer in addition to ventilation wow. and filtration. And if you have to wear a mask. So for me, it may not happen fast enough because I spent hours talking to the EPA and OSHA and FDA and CDC, and nobody can say, like, it's so disjointed. Who says this is safe? Right. The FDA says that there's no long-term safety uh, data. The CDC says it's promising, but more studies have to be done. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with people like Don Milton, who's a who's an aerosol scientist, uh, University of Maryland, saying, Look, let's just try it in a few places, which is, is happening and see what happens. Now that, you know, it's a risk benefit thing. There could be, who knows? We you gotta be humble. There could be some long-term bad side effect. But if you think about it, the risk benefit during a pandemic or the next pandemic, which God forbid it's bird flu or pandemic flu, we're not we've already shown we we're not as a population, we don't do well with wearing masks and following public health advice. So if we could do something which just mm -hmm with a flick of a switch would significantly decrease the amount of virus in a room, not to mention influenza and other things, that would be great. So I'm saying that in a very excited way. I think this technology is really promising. It doesn't seem to be ready for prime time this very, very second, but I, I think people are gonna be out there working on that. So I wanted to introduce that. This is the first time on Stars in the House that we're talking about this, um, so that's it. Um, now, do you want to get to, to ask me other questions about Paxlovid and long COVID? And, I will, but Judy, do you want to do you want to say good night, and I'll continue, and you'll uh, you'll I'll, or do you have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I should go can make an appointment for my second booster. <laughs> That's the conclusion <laughs> here. Um, but I just went off for a really long time, and I'm I actually now I'm feeling guilty about that. Did, did you want to ask some more stuff, uh, Judy? No, that's really the thing no, that's. That was for me personally, I mean, there's God. I mean, there's. So I mean, I've got questions people. that I'm going to ask you when Judy goes. But Judy, I mean, the bottom line here is that everybody's going to get COVID eventually. I mean, it's just too. And, and you think about you think about Omicron, you get it. You know, it, it it's sitting there coiled, waiting to strike. It just it's, it's going to get you. Okay, very contagious. The good news is that most people do very very well with it. Yeah. Now you have to be vaccinated. You know, yeah. people are going, oh, it's a weaker. Th no, it's weaker if you're vaccinated. People say it's really yeah. not weaker. That's what I thought when I had it. I was like, oh, thank God I'm vaccinated exactly. because the body can take this off. And, you know. Can you imagine with all of the pushback that, that, that the health profession has gotten about the vaccines if they hadn't worked? No. I mean, this pushback that you're seeing is what happens with 50 million people not getting it still. That's what happens when you have an unbelievably spectacular vaccine that works amazingly more, amazingly better than anybody expected. We yeah. wanted 70% effective. There was 95% at the beginning right. until the variants came. I mean, huge home run. Yeah. So, you know, the, so for everybody out there, please, vaccines. Yes. And Judy, you stay safe because you've got a concert coming up with Seth on Sunday. I know I can't get COVID but before Sunday. <laughs> no, no, you're going to be tested right before you're with Seth Rudetsky. Yeah. All right, I Judy. Am. All right. See you on sure. Sunday. Good to see, see you, me. James. Say hello, to, Say hello to your lovely husband and daughter. I certainly will. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. So, Dr. Lepook. We meet again. We meet again. I texted you on Monday and I said, I got back on Saturday. I tested positive on Saturday. And you were like, you need to be on Paxlovid. And it was my, so it was my third day and you said you have to take it before the fifth day. And I had, it's one of those things that I had heard of it, but I really didn't know that much about it. So I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, what, what is it and why is it important? Why, why take that over the antibodies? Because I know someone who recently tested positive and, um, and they chose to do the infusion. Bebtilovimab. Bebtilovimab. They, they name these things really easily. Yeah. Bebtilovimab. It's the latest monoclonal that, you know, the first ones, the first generations like Regeneron, they stopped working very well against the variants. So this oh, okay. seems to work better. Yeah. Why does, why does someone pick one over the other? And in the end, are they basically equal? Is one just easier to take because it's a pill? Yeah, it is. It is easier to um, to prescribe the pill, um, but for for and the antibody seems to work very well. There aren't, you know, we don't 
know yet exactly the numbers with the new variant and the uh, bebtilovimab, but it seems in the in the lab in vitro, V-I-T-R-O, as opposed to in vivo and in, in a somebody, it seems to be working pretty well against the variant. But uh, let's go over a little primer on yeah. Paxlovid, which I thought was Paxlovid until we did a piece and the company said it's Paxlovid. Okay, Paxlovid. Okay. Anyway, Emphasis whatever. On the second syllable. Okay, very Paxlovid. good. Paxlovid. Okay, it's a medication by Pfizer. I know, you know, I've no dog in the fight here. I'm, right. just, I'm just telling you it's Pfizer. Um, and um, it stops viral replication. So what's happening in that first week, remember, it was the first week and the second week. We talked about this two years yeah. ago. That first week, the virus is multiplying like crazy. You're not maybe that sick, right? The second week is when your immune system sees all the virus, overreacts, and starts attacking not only the virus, but yourself. That's where you get the damage to the lungs and the and the kidneys and the liver and the blood vessels and the head. That, that's that second phase. And remember that second phase where they, they found that you give steroids to decrease, to dampen the response of the body. Even though you would think steroids would dampen the immune response, you want the immune response. It's too much of an immune response. Mm. That's going to come back in a second. So okay. it made perfect sense. So they did a study, remarkable results. Paxlovid decreased hospitalization and death by 88%, okay, if given within five days. Wow. But here's the thing, and I just went back and checked with Pfizer about this to make sure. It was in unvaccinated people, people who are not vaccinated. Do we know how good it does, what, I... how much of a difference it makes for people who are vaccinated? We don't really know. That study is going on right now, but we don't have the number. But what makes sense and what's recommended by the, by the CDC is people who are at high risk for a bad outcome uh, should consider Paxlovid. Now, there's a long list. You have to go to the CDC website for things they consider at high risk. But, you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, obesity, smoking, and there are a bunch of other things, lung disease, kidney disease. Right. So I have high blood pressure. So that would be one of the – so that would qualify me for probably right. needing to take it. That's what you're – when I – yeah, yeah that was like what it. that was what made you qualify. Now, here's the thing that's happened in the last couple of weeks is that um, now, first of all, there are drug interactions. So it's not so simple. Paxlovid can stop the liver's ability to break down your other medications. And what that ends up doing mm -hmm. is raising the level of those medicines. Those medicines usually get eliminated by the liver and they're, they stay up there because I'm going to put the in frame there. They stay up there because the Paxlovid is stopping the liver from breaking them down. So the result is other medicines like statins, you know, Lipitor, Crestor, those things, um, Pravacol, they can be too high. So you have to adjust or stop these other medications. And it's, you have to look at a chart and see which ones are metabolized by the liver. And it's kind of a pain in the neck to do, but you got to do it. And so you talk about that. It can give you a metallic taste. It can give you some diarrhea, some GI stuff. But generally five days, three pills, twice a day. If you have right. renal failure, if you have a certain degree of renal dysfunction, lack of function, you have to lower the dose of one of the two pills. So five days and you're done. We thought, great. And people I, we were giving it to, in fact, they turned negative quickly, like after three or four days, they felt better quickly. And we thought, great, the problem is supply. Now, in the last week or two, uh, it's really become apparent that there is what's being called a Paxlovid rebound. Now, the company is not willing to say right. that that's happening yet, um, but uh, because they say that it happened just as much in placebo as in the people getting the drug. But more and more people who I personally know and who I've read about and who my colleagues are talking about have noticed the phenomena that you take the Paxlovid for five days, you feel better, you may test negative, and then about five to 10 days after you stop the Paxlovid, as the Paxlovid washes out of the system and starts to go away, symptoms can come back for a few days. You can turn positive for a few days. And, and be contagious and, again. And potentially be contagious. That's what the CDC is trying to figure out. Right. We, that's an asterisk. I keep talking about these asterisks. There's a case report or two where we think that happened, but you got to get genetic you know, analysis to prove it's the same one that came up. Now, I can tell you that the theory 
I spoke to David Ho, this fan, the fantastic virologist from Columbia, who, um, who told me that what he thinks is probably happening is that the virus is frozen in various stages of replication. So you're taking the Paxlovid, it's kind of in suspended animation. Now, a lot of it probably isn't able to be revived. And depending upon your immune system, when it's when when it wash it, when the Paxlovid washes out of your system and the virus starts to replicate again, those little, little amount of virus that can replicate, right. your your your, your uh, regular immune system can crush it. That's the end of it. But for some people, that may not happen. Their immune system may not have kicked in quickly enough. And one reason why it may not have kicked in quickly enough, a theory, is that because the Paxlovid brought the virus level down, your immune system didn't see it for long enough to get the sniff of the scent like a bloodhound. So it, did, it, did, it didn't get activated enough. So when it comes back and starts to grow, it now takes the, the immune system again a few days to control it. The people who I've spoken to have had that, have had symptoms again for another few days, kind of light, and then they go away. But if you do the math, it could be, because the CDC says, remember, you isolate for the first five days, day one being the day zero being the first day of symptoms or or testing positive. So if you get for me it was actually both. Okay. <laughs> Literally so, the same thing. So if it, if it if it were today, today is there you go. Yeah, if, there we go. If today were if if today is what, Tuesday? So let's today say you had today's day zero, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is the end of day five. So Monday, day six, according to the CDC, you can now leave isolation, put on a really good, well-fitting, good mask, and from six to 10, wear that mask around others. However, they say, say if you can test, then if you have one of these rapid antigens, go ahead and test after day five. So for me, it's day six before I'm ready to go out to the world. And if you're positive, it just makes sense you're still you're still infectious. You're still contagious because remember the rapid antigen is a lot less sensitive than the PCR. So if you're a positive, remember Michael Minna telling us that if you're positive on a on a uh, a rapid antigen test, you're probably contagious. So you should stay in isolation. I feel that's not the official CDC advice right. because they they sort of say test again. Okay. But I think that makes sense. It's what but, I'm doing. And 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 until you test negative up until day, day ten. Now if you're still testing, the second you test negative, like you know day seven, you test negative. You might, just to be sure, test one more negative. Right, right. If you have two negatives in a row, you're free to go out in the world wearing a mask through day 10. Day 11, if you're, you know, everything's great, you've tested negative, you feel great, you can take off that mask and rejoin the, the normal world. So that's- so Because for me, today is day 10, because I was, I knew to, to do the day I right. found out as day zero, today is my day 10. And really only yesterday did the line start to become faint and it's so still the, there. Exactly. So, so what I'm telling my patients now, and again, this is not official CDC advice. It's right, my advice. Day 11 through 15, if you've been on Paxlovid and you're about to go out into the world, to me, it makes sense day 11 through 15 to do that daily Binax again. Right. The last thing you want to do is think you're fine go out and infect people. That is the problem. And David Ho feels this way. It's not the clinical problem of Maxlovid. He did an analysis and it didn't seem like it was mutating. Didn't seem like it was, you know, becoming more deadly. It was just sort of dampened and then came back the same one. But think about it. You're faked out into thinking, oh, it's day yeah. 10. I can go out and then you can infect other people. So I think we're, we don't know quite what to do here. But it's very apparent, you know, you can't close your eyes and say, you know, I'm not I'm not looking. So it's not happening. Right. You know, this, this seems to be happening. People are reporting it way too often. The CDC has no idea how frequent it is. They say it's infrequent, but I don't know how frequent it is. It seems to be more frequent than people are saying right now. And it's going and, and, and the big question is how frequently, let's say in that period where you're testing positive for a few days, how infectious are you? We don't know. We don't know. And if it turns out that you're really not that infectious, it could happen. It looks like there's some case reports, but you're not that infectious. Then it's less important in terms of guidelines of when you come out and how long you test. Right now, Pfizer saying don't go past the five days. You know, people. Some people saying should you should you test should you treat longer. So 
I'm sorry for everybody that we don't have the answer to this, but we don't have the answer to this. And since people are doing quite well uh, who are being fully vaxxed, if you're not at high risk, because a lot of people are saying, I'm, you know, I'm 35, but I, I want to get rid of this quickly. Give me the Paxlovid. You know, maybe not such a good idea because you may end up prolonging the amount of time. Right. You have to be in isolation. But do you think like for me who got it on day three that my body had had enough time to build up uh, antibodies? Uh, I, you, you know, know I, mean? I, I maybe I, do, I don't know. Probably because you've had you had two boosters. You had two boosters or one? And I had one booster. You had one booster. So I don't know. It might have been just sort of. Right. Hanging out, wait, I mean, the booster wait, was wait. at the end of September, you know, it was a while. I'm going to give you the other thing to, to now have to make your make your like this. Um, I'm doing a piece on long COVID, which is defined as anywhere from, you know, symptoms for three to six months. Yeah, we don't know there's up to 70 symptoms. I see on talk about long COVID. Yeah, yeah, you there's see piece, that right there. You know, but it's brain fog, it's fatigue, it's it can be breathing and pain with chest pain and breathing problems and and all sorts of other things that don't seem to have any abnormal tests. Uh, and by the way, I think that, you know, all those people for many years who were told who had the chronic Lyme and the chronic fibromyalgia and the chronic yep. fatigue syndrome who were told it's in your head, it wasn't in your head. It was probably some form of this. Interesting. Um, and um, we can talk about possible theories of long COVID, which, because uh, I'm doing this big story on it, but the guy who is, um, who's heading up the, the NIH program on this, the $1.1 billion multicentric program to try to figure this out. He told me that the odds of getting COVID are anywhere from 5 to 30%. Looks like maybe it'll settle around 10%. So if you're vaccinated, it looks like it goes down to 5%. It goes in half, or you know, it goes in half, whatever that initial starting number was that it looks like the risk of long COVID is related to how much virus, the viral load that you have. Oh, I see. So that's why the, the vaccines, which can lower the viral load probably, can decrease that risk. But now we're thinking, obviously, everybody out there has the same idea. Oh, does Paxlovid, which decreases viral replication, can that lower the odds of getting long COVID? Right. And we don't know that, and they haven't started the studies yet, really. And people are going to look at that. We'll know the answer to that, a long, I think, a long time from now, a year or two. But so we're hoping that it that it cuts down. It makes sense to me that it does, but here you have an, an example of the unintended, possibly unintended consequences of Paxlovid, which seem like a no-brainer. And still, if you're at high risk, I think the risks, for me, the benefits outweigh the risks. Right. Right. But if you're somebody who's not at high risk, which was so many people who were saying, I know it's an emergency use authorization and it's supposed to be for people at high risk, but I really want to get the Paxlovid. Not not so not so sure, especially if you're younger and you're healthy, you probably just be sick for three to five days and then you'll be fine. Now, the antibodies don't seem to have that rebound thing because probably because the antibodies stay with you for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so. So that's what I was going to ask you. So, you know, you you read because I was doing a lot of reading, of course, um, while I was in bed. Um, and and it seemed like there's a lot of different theories that it seems like the base is that everyone seems to agree that you've got about three months of like relative safety after you've had it. Is that true? I don't know how much the relative safety is, because. Um, I've had people get reinfected. You know, there's different strains now of the Omicron, you know, the BA1, 2, 12, and, all, you know, right. all, all BA2, 12. Um, so I don't know the answer. And I don't think anybody else does. I think you are probably relatively protected. But look, let's just go down to the, to the bottom line here. Yeah. We're all fed up with this pandemic and we want to take our masks off. We want to get back to our lives. And what's happening now to me reminds me at, at the end of a, fireworks display when you say oh it's over let's go home and all of a sudden there's that last right flare of, of of infection i think we're seeing that now obviously we're seeing this across the country but most people are doing pretty well but when you have so many people who are infected even if most people do well the number of people who are hospitalized is going up and don't be faked out by this because the number of people who are vaccinated has gone up, obviously, it doesn't go down, it just keeps going up. Percentage-wise, the number of people hospitalized who were vaccinated is going to go up. Right. It just stands to reason. So at the beginning, it was like way higher. 
you know, could be 20 times more people were unvaccinated than vaccinated if they were hospitalized. That's going to go down. Don't be faked out if you see that in statistics. It's because more people are vaccinated. So statistically. Speaking of statistics, because I was wondering this, because so, so many of us are finding out, like I did, uh, that we're positive from a home test. Are we supposed to report it to the CDC or like, what are we, are we, do we have a responsibility to report it? Yeah. It would be nice. There are pro. There are applications where you can report it, um, and I, you know, I think it's a good idea. I think everybody knows that it's that we're way underreporting because they're not. You know, people do it at home, and so it's probably a lot more people. You know, when the epidemiologists and the people who plot out statistically what's happening, they predict what's going to happen in the future. They now take into account with forecasting that whatever the number is that we think. That have been officially recorded, right. it's, you know, it's much higher than that. Could be five to ten times higher. Than that, you know. Do you do you um what do you, what is the rec is there a recommendation for for people who've had COVID? Let's say me. Um, and as far as getting that second booster, I mean, do you? Yeah, wait I would. I, months or I would say that. Well, the CDC told me. I can't tell you how many times I, I keep going back to them on this. Yeah. coming back. Person who I've been talking to the most said, as soon as you are feeling fine totally recovered, you can go ahead and get it. Oh, wow. And because it's different, it's a different boost. And, you know, obviously if you've had an adverse reaction to the first one or to the, to the booster that, you know, you, you talked, no matter what, you're going to talk to your healthcare provider about sure. it. But um, there's no reason for the CDC to wait, you know, following COVID, uh, assuming that you're totally recovered. And is, and is there any guidance regarding like if, You've had Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer for the next one to be Moderna. Is there what was what's the thought on that? Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer. <laughs> right, exactly. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. That's right. Um, so Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer. There may be some theoretical slight benefit to switching it up. If you had Pfizer do Moderna, Moderna do Pfizer. It it doesn't make enough of a difference, it looks like, because they're both oh, very effective too. If it's logistically difficult to do, you know, get the one that's easy to do. Um, what's most important is that third one, whether you want to switch it up or not get something. And then I'll leave you with one other thought. For long COVID, um, there is some suggestion for people who have long COVID that when it, sometimes when they get vaccinated, their symptoms get better. Why would that be? Because there are four theories for long COVID that, that are the leading ones. One is that there are actually residual pieces of virus, active or residual pieces of genetic material that are in your system sequestered that the body doesn't get rid of. So the, your body's still at war. It's still trying to attack that. And you're having, you're feeling the effects of the war that's going on in you. Right. The second is that the virus may be totally gone, but your immune system hasn't turned off for some reason. It's an autoimmune process. The third is dysbiosis, which is the trillions of you know, the microbiome in the gut, the trillions of bacteria and thousands of, of different species that are there have been disrupted by COVID and it looks like that happens and they can have huge effects on the body. Mm. And the fourth is direct tissue ish injury, which is, you know, you're in the ICU, you had lung injury or heart injury. And obviously that that's easier to understand. It takes a while for that to heal. So those are the four reasons. So if there is residual virus there and giving the vaccine boosts your immune system so that it can finally root out that residual virus, then that could be a mechanism why that might work. And it makes me think, and I asked, you know, the experts about this. They said, yeah, we have to design the study to see, well, could Paxlovid help long COVID? If there are people out there who still have residual virus, right. it's an antiviral. So, But on the other hand, from what we're seeing now, maybe it just would temporarily work. So I don't know. <laughs> How many well, times have I said that this pandemic? <laughs> Before we before we say goodnight, I mean two year two plus years ago when we started the show, you you uh, started saying, "Are we at the beginning of the beginning, the middle? That where are we? The beginning, the middle of the end yeah. of all of this? Do we, do we I, know I more?" Do, yeah, I I do feel, you know, Tony Fauci said, and he and he got some pushback. He had to rephrase it, you know, oh. that we're out of the you know whatever he said exuberant pandemic part of it. The, you know, but really, you're seeing a a, a, a flare up again of the number of cases. Um, but this is not the same pandemic of two years ago. Two years ago, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have antivirals, 
we didn't know so much. And, uh, you know, the monoclonal antibodies, we didn't know so much about how to treat it. You know, we when I was on the COVID wards in April of 2020, I was afraid I might die. Sure. You know, if I got infected, I might die. I'm not afraid of that now. I mean, there are people who die. Uh, and we have to still worry about the immunocompromised out there who are still yeah. being ignored. I yeah. well, not ignored, but not paying enough attention. And that's why I love the UV light, far UV light thing, because that would take care of helping to decrease risk for people who aren't vaccinated or immunocompromised. But um, it's not the same as it was. And even we're finding that the vaccine is, even is helping people who have had leukemia and other bad diseases. It still helps them. So, you know, in terms of me being worried, about going out, I'm not worried about dying. What I'm worried about is missing an important event, seriously. So right. you have to think about what are you gonna be doing in the next two to three weeks or four weeks? Because if I get infected, if I go to an event, all right, I wanna to go to an event. Now, let me think about it. First of all, what am I doing in the next two to three weeks if I get infected? Am I seeing somebody vulnerable? Am I, do I have something really important I can't miss? I'm giving, Harvard had the, the TH Chan, the Harvard TH Chan School of uh, Public Health um, had the poor judgment to ask me to be their commencement speaker uh, <laughs> this Memorial Day uh, for two classes, 2020 and 2021, because they missed it. And oh, wow. 2022. So I have to be okay on Memorial Day weekend. So I'm working my way backwards. And I'm going to be especially careful then if I get infected today. Well, maybe the incubation period, it's normally within what, you know, two to four days, five days, something like right. that. And then I'm going to be, I'm out for another 10 days. That's 15 days. That's two weeks. Yeah. Maybe longer if I decide to take Paxlovid and get a rebound. So, you know, I think that's how people have to think about it and what they're doing. It remains to be seen if it's going to peter out and become endemic. I believe somebody, you know, somebody asked what's going to happen in the fall. In the, I, Judy, I, Judy right? was asking that, right. A hundred million I, people. I expect is... to see it, it come up in the fall. The, you know, the virus likes, um, it likes uh, cold and dry. That's what we start to see then. And that's when we see people coming indoors and congregating. And right now, you know, everybody's going in. A lot of people are going indoors. And somebody was just in a uh, uh, in a workspace. They told me 70, they, she actually counted 7% of the people were wearing masks indoors. So I get it. I get it. It's really, it's hard to stay on alert for so long. But I think it's, but I think that's probably, we, we've been talking, you've been talking for a long time now about the risk factors and, and I think, uh, not risk factors, but as far as, as kind of, what's the, what's the phrase? Risk benefit I, profile. Thank Your risk you. Risk benefit analysis. Yes. Of like this event for Memorial Day is really, really important to you. So you're going to put on, you're going to do extra precautions. But Absolutely. for me, it's like now that I'm going to be hopefully negative tomorrow and it'll be my 11th day. It's like there's cancer support community gala that I really want to go to. And they've been asking me and I've been putting it off and it's on Thursday night. And like most galas these days, they're indoors and they're meals and I haven't eaten indoors, but I might say yes, because I feel like it'll be okay. And I'll test right before, but even that's, you know, so I am, I'm tempted to go, but yeah. it's, it's a weird feeling because I haven't eaten indoors. Yeah. It's psychologically, it's, it's really can be tough. Don't forget, everybody, that the rapid tests, they can test negative for one, two, even three days. If you're feeling sick, fine. Try the try the fast, the rapid antigen, because they're easier. If you're feeling sick, though, and that's negative, e either, either assume you're positive or get a PCR, yeah. because yeah. the PCR is going to be positive before the, the rapid test, the rapid antigen. Well, because of the possible bounce back, when we do our benefit a week from today, I'm actually going to be doing my part here because there are going to be extra people in our apartment and everyone will be testing. But still, because as you've as you've said, as Michael Mena has said, the test is only it's a moment in time when you take that test. And I don't want other people to be around us for several hours and God forbid something happens. So I'm actually going to be doing my part here. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, you you set it up that they're doing it as they enter the apartment, you know, because you're probably good for several hours. If they do it in the morning, you know, I'll just no, no, it. we always do it right when they walk in. Are you right kidding? Before them walking. Like, We've seen stars in the house. We know. <laughs> That's right. Oh my. All right, Dr. LaPook, thank you so much for, um, for being a guiding force for not just me, but for all of our viewers and everyone. So thank you so much. And for everybody out there, hang in there. I know, I know it's so hard. It's so hard on me too. But um, I do think we're getting there. And uh, 
we're getting towards normal. All right. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. All right.